like the market is not really uh, pulling back in any uh, sort of big fashion or anything of that sort. We are uh, kind of not going anywhere. 99.34 is where the Nifty is. Bank Nifty, though, is doing better. Aditya Narayan is head of research at Edelweiss Securities. He's joining us on the sidelines of the Edelweiss Consumer Durables Day with the thoughts on the sector and the overall market. Aditya, thank you very much. I mean, you were here with the consumer, your consumer durables analyst, uh, what, it was a month and a half back? And uh, you had got that big report with you, and we had discussed some of the top picks out of that. And I guess you were out on the road marketing that report. Tell us, I mean, what's the feedback, uh, feedback been like, and uh, any additional inputs on uh, the on the report itself? Go on. No, the, the, the feedback has actually been very positive. Um, our analyst has actually visited different geographies across Europe uh, uh, and the U.S. Uh, and there has actually been a lot of interest. You know, this is a space where companies have actually become pretty large. Uh, they've got a fair amount of momentum. And so far, while some of them are reasonably valued, um, they, they actually haven't been caught on by a huge part of the investing audience. So I think there's actually been a very good feedback. And part of the reason to actually hold this consumer uh, durable day was really as a follow-up and to make sure that, um, you know, just more of the investing market has a better sense of uh, these businesses. Was there, uh, I mean pushback uh, with regards to valuations, etc., from investors? That is there just as it is there at the market level. But, you know, given that their business models have tended to change so much uh, mm -hmm. and the branding element of, their, of, the, of, of these companies is building up so much, uh, I think there's a fair amount of acceptance, particularly with a couple of stocks. Okay. Uh, Aditya, I wanted your thoughts particularly on, say, a margin problem that, say, Symphony faced in the previous quarter in Q1. They have guided that, yes, there will be a recovery uh, going forward. But how confident are you about, say, margins coming, bouncing back to what they used to be previously, say, over 20-odd percent? See, at the moment, you have, you've had a disruptive quarter. You might have another quarter or two, which is mm. uh, disrupted, uh, disrupted. Uh, largely on the back of you know, some carry through of the demon issues, some bit as far as the GST is concerned. But as I said, I think the interesting thing with these companies is just that their business models are very, very interesting. You're moving really into a branded uh, discretionary spend area where I think your ability to charge up actually remains significant, if not, if not the fact that it actually grows. So to that extent, I don't see anything fundamentally challenging in terms of the margins that these companies are seeing. Uh, and as I said, I think there's been a disrupted quarter, uh, and that's why you're seeing some of these dips. Okay, so you're dividing FI18 into two halves then, the first half, which is probably going to be disruptive, and the second half, which is going to see a good amount of recovery. Is that how you're looking at it? In some senses, I think, obviously, it's going to be more and more back-ended. Uh, so this quarter, for instance, Winston's will probably also be a little slack. But I think given that the festival season is beginning to build up, uh, I think you actually should end up seeing a second half, which is distinctly better than the first half. And typically, it's a question of the run rate that you run after that. And I think that will tend to be pretty decent into the next year. Okay, Aditya, I uh, wanted your thoughts in terms of what you're propagating to your clients as your top picks. Uh, I know you're bullish on quite a few of the consumer durable stocks, but do you have a pecking order within that as well? So typically we have KEI, we have uh, Symphony uh, as really the two top picks that we have in the space and we like Crompton's. You know, I just want to ask you, uh, <clears throat> so these talks we discussed, but from as far as investors are concerned, which is the one name where you sense the most amount of acceptance and bullishness really? I think within this this uh, span of companies that we've covered, KEI has the one is the one that has received actually the most amount of interest. Uh, in part also because valuations are a little lower and uh, uh, it's a smaller company. <coughs> Fair enough, Aditya. Uh, since we have you uh, with us here, why don't you just let us know what you make of uh, the aggregate market itself? I mean, uh, you know, there is some churn, some sell-off, sideways movement, uh, but it doesn't get you. Worried or are you actually comforted by the fact that there is some time correction happening? Well, I think the time has been too short to call this time correction, but I think clearly there is some level of uh, leveling off. That's only natural. Uh, you know, I see nothing to suggest that we need to step back in terms of a fairly bullish call, uh, which is really that the market will do well, the market will remain valued uh, reasonably high. Uh, so there's nothing for us to really backpedal on that. I think there's typically going to be a certain amount of leveling off. 
there still is a certain amount of uncertainty in terms of how restocking has taken place uh, into the second quarter. So I think people will be, you know, will keep some of their fingers crossed uh, and you won't necessarily have a very strong second quarter. But X of that, I think the fundamental driver, the fundamental direction, and I think the valuation framework that the market will sit on, nothing really changes there. We remain pretty comfortable. Okay. How closely are you monitoring what's happening on the Korean Peninsula then? Well, you know, I read the papers in the morning and during the day and in the evenings and the wires too. So reasonably uh, closely. But uh, I think what you've got to keep in mind is that you've seen a lot of global events that have effectively played through over the last uh, couple of years. And I think the markets have built up a certain amount of cushion towards them. So I think unless something actually happens, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's going to be plus minus one or two percent rather than anything more dramatic. If something does happen, you know, obviously the impact will be greater than just minus one or two percent, but it's not going to be as catastrophic as most people uh, believe such events could be. Okay, fair enough, Aditya. We're going to let you go and uh, best of luck for your Consumer Durables conference as well. Thanks very much for joining in. Uh, well, before we take a break, just want to point out a particular news piece that, Nal uh, that uh, Nigel has rather sent us about Nalco and that stock is actually surging. It's up around 5 to 6 odd percent. We understand that alumina prices are up around 15 odd percent in the last five days or rather 15 days. So maybe there is some amount of... Um, you know, correlation which is coming in from that because it derives 80% of its EBITDA from alumina sales. So you're seeing that uh, little bit of optimism which is coming in for Nalco. We think Nigel is with us now to tell us about the surge in Nalco. Nigel, over to you. Well, that's right, Ekta. You know, the reason why, in fact, Nalco is surging is because alumina prices, they're up by close to around 15%. If you just take a look at it in the last uh, 10 to around 15 days, I ha reached out to the management as well of Nalco. And what they tell me is that one of their consignments had left yesterday at around $397 per ton. Remember, the average price for the last quarter was at around $360 per ton. So clearly, there has been a surge internationally. And that's reflected in some of Nalco's shipments uh, as well. Why is alumina prices surged? One factor being there have been capacity shutdowns. Uh, in fact, there's been tightness of supply in China's uh, Sang Shangzi as well as in the Hebei region. That's one factor. The second factor has been there has been some disruption in bauxite mining. And the third and the very important factor is that there has been a surge even in caustic soda prices. What I understand is that, in fact, on a per, uh, you know, a caustic soda was uh, approximately 20, 29,000. Now, that's moved to around 38, 39,000. So you keep your eye out also on companies like Gujarat Alkalis because they have some part of their revenues coming in from uh, caustic soda. At one point of time, what the street thought was there will be surplus in alumina because aluminium capacities were shutting down, but alumina could be in surplus. Now, that is not likely to be. There is tightness that we're seeing in terms of supply of alumina, and that's what's leading to a big surge in alumina prices. For Nalco, why is it important? Close on 75 to around 80 percent of their EBITDA comes in from alumina, and uh, that's really the driving uh, point for them going uh, going ahead. You'll tell me, well, alumina could be an import for some, uh, you know, could be an input cost for some of the uh, other producers. For Hindalco, well, they get all their uh, alumina supply. They are self-sufficient uh, in that uh, context. But for Vidanta, close to around 50 to around 60 percent, or maybe around 40 to around 45, 50 percent approximately of their alumina requirements, they buy it from the open market. So for them, it could be a tad bit of a negative on their operating profit. Back okay. to you. Okay, Nigel, we're going to leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and taking us through that. With that, it's also a wrap on Trading Us. Stay tuned. Halftime Report will be up next.